Thank you. Um, I want to say first that uh, this talk comes from the experiences I made uh, in past few years, and especially in the Free IPA project. I will mention the Free IPA project because that's what driven this talk. But I hope, sorry, I hope it will uh, apply it also to a, a generic way to build an identity management system on, on Linux. Uh, a question: How many of you know what it is a management system, an identity management system? Oh, a few. And how many of you use one? Okay, thanks. So let me try to define what it is, because the problem is that there isn't a very good definition, and so I try to make my own and, and then stick to that. So in a nutshell, an identity management system is a set of services and roles uh, that is, are used in an organization to manage the users. And I use users in a very broad way here. By users, I mean any actor that actually has to interact with identities. It includes information about individuals, what normally are called users in a computer system, but also about computers, about groups, about the roles of users and groups on computers and networks, uh, about authentication, authorization rules, uh, and it applies also to device managed by the system. That, and by device, I, again, I use a very broad uh, definition. It's not just computers. It could be appliances. It could be uh, other smart devices like phones, even, uh, or even just you know uh, access points, uh, network uh, appliances, network devices. Um, and an identity management system is always used, even if it's not really recognizable sometimes, uh, when you have to handle more than a few machines. Uh, Any time an organization have to handle a number of machines that is about three, four, five. You have to find a way to organize and manage identities and the machines themselves in a network. So it's a very broad definition. And uh, from this broad definition, I'm going to talk uh, mostly about uh, what you can find in a, in a data center or uh, in a company that uses Linux. Uh, so <clears throat> let's also define a bit about uh, what are identities. Uh, when you when you see this word, you usually think about uh, users, persons. You might think about uh, official identification documents and stuff like that. Uh, but computers, uh, or even programs, sometimes just a single programs, often need an identity of their own. Uh, for uh, for admins, it's it's easy to see this when they run an application as a specific user on the system. What they are doing is effectively they're giving an identity to this program because they need to, uh, to apply some authorization or some authentication uh, to that specific program. <coughs> and identity is also managed in groups uh, because applying authorization decision to groups is much easier than picking every single user, especially when users are not just people but even just single applications on machines. So what do we need to manage in an identity management system? At the core, what people really need to manage, there is the user's life cycle. And that is very simple in the end. It's all about creation of users in the system, uh, deletion, and various status changes. Uh, uh, like, you know, whether the user is enabled, not enabled, uh, when it starts. Uh, some users go into dormant state, come back later, that cannot be deleted, things like that. Uh, the other part, very important part, that's a, you know, like day-to-day -day part, is relations. Um, users are often put in groups. Uh, users have roles. And those are really the reasons why you need users in the system in the end. You need to identify a user because the user need to have relations to machines and to other users. It needs to authenticate to machines. It needs to relate to other users. It needs to uh, be able to operate in a way that the computer knows what are the privileges that this user is given so that I can perform the actions um, that other users may be not able to. Um, and then there are policies about this user. Uh, uh, like passwords, uh, passwords very much used still, 
Uh, so you have to try to make sure that users don't use too simple passwords, or maybe in some places you want to have them change the password often for whatever reason. Um, and so you have to manage all this user's life cycle. Um, <clears throat> and when the system is big and com complicated, uh, you need a way so that this management doesn't really uh, take too much time because you have to make sure that all these users can operate on all the machines of the system. Uh, think about administrators in a data center with thousands of machines. You cannot go to an every single machine and add the user to the password file. You need the system to distribute this information. You need to make sure that this information is always up to date and applicable to all machines. Uh, <clears throat> and that you need to make sure that it is not outdated uh, because uh, if the information is not propagated properly, uh, you have administrators or even just normal users that cannot access some machines or uh, users that shouldn't be able to access some machines still can because the rules have not been brought there. Um, the other part, which is sometimes less uh, evident, is computers' life cycle. Computers, as I said, have identities as well. So computers need to be introduced in the network. Uh, I call that enrollment. And sometimes they need to be retired. Uh, they have all uh, kind of properties like a name on the network so that the specific system can be recognizable. And all these things need to be somehow managed because as for users, when you deploy machines and you have many of them, you need a way to identify them uh, in a way that, is, uh, that makes sense to the user uh, in a way that is secure so that you cannot have people bring in or bring out machines without you knowing from the, uh, from the system. Um, connected to that is the creation or revocation of keys uh, for a bit large network. This could be Kerberos keys, could be SSH keys, X509 certificates, which are nothing else but a wrapping around the key. And this is all just to make it possible to rec recognize a specific machine in a network. <laughs> and again, policies as, as well. Uh, you need to tie access control to a machine usually. Uh, when you have a very large network, you have quite a number of users, and they're not doing all the same thing. So you may have databases, you could you may have web servers, you could have you know CRMs, whatever kind of machines. Are. And there are a set of users that are allowed to use each of these machines. And each user also needs authorization because some of these users are, you know, are power users, they can change the configuration of the machines, uh, and even their these admins might have different levels of authorization. Some, author some admins are allowed to change security properties. Other admins may be allowed to change only some application of the machines. So there's all these life cycles all also that goes into management systems. And there are additionally other security aspects of networking <coughs> that are more at the, at the network level. Uh, things like simple DHCP and DNS, which are given for granted, still need to be managed and are all security related because today uh, resolving names is part of the equation. <clears throat> so when you come to the problem of how to manage all these identities, uh, users and computers alike, uh, and you have a very large network, uh, you come to a problem uh, about how do I, you know, what to do? Do I centralize all this management in one system or do I try to distribute uh, management. Um, and ideally, uh, you would like to be very flexible in how you build a system so that if, you know, if the situation changes, you can change the way you manage things. Unfortunately, embedding this flexibility uh, in something that deals with security and with authorization authentication, it's not very easy. So there are very hard choices to make and often they have to be made well in advance when you're trying to architect this stuff. You cannot do these changes later. Uh, and this problem hits multiple levels, whether to centralize or distribute information. <clears throat> At the networking level, uh, you need to decide how you want to uh, distribute the services that manage uh, identities so that uh, you can, uh, for example, avoid uh, single point of failure 
you would like to have services to widespread so that if one goes down, or another can take over easily. Um, but distributing information is also in itself uh, a difficult problem. Uh, so how, how do you decide what is the right balance there? Uh, security, uh, there uh, centralization tend to be uh, preferred for the simple reason that you want to reduce the tax surface. So you don't want to spread your uh, database of keys or password uh, over too many machines because then you increase the tax surface. Any of the machine that holds uh, keys that can give access to the network uh, becomes a point of attack. So you have, again, a tendency there you want to centralize but if you centralize too, too much, you might have single point of failures. So it's a very hard problem. And finally, <clears throat> uh, centralization distribution also affects administration. Um, you generally might want to be able to delegate uh, the tasks to multiple people, and that's a way of distributing uh, the tasks. However, uh, to perform some tasks, you might need quite high privileges. And so again, you need to have, find a way uh, to balance uh, the privileges you distribute. Because the more you distribute privileges among the population of users, the more you increase the tax surface. Uh, so being able to finally uh, distribute privileges, delegate only specific uh, tasks to users helps. As you can reduce the number of things they can do, you reduce also the attack surface for the whole network. So, centralization, as I, as I mentioned already, uh, may be interesting for many reasons. It makes management easier. If you have less machines to control, uh, it is easier to control them. It makes reporting about these machines easier. Uh, it makes reporting about users easier. It makes enforcement easier sometimes. It makes development much easier. Uh, Distributed systems are hard. On the other hand, distributed systems tend to be much more resilient, resilient to failure. So how to choose exactly which functions to centralize and how to distribute information is a very uh, difficult choice. And it's something that is not, um, it doesn't have a, a fixed recipe for all situations. It's more an art than anything. And you have to choose in your own architecture, or you have to use a product that made the choice for you. Uh, but even then, before you can choose a product, you have to decide whether it meets your, your requirements or not. Uh, scalability, you know, resilience of failure, security, they all go against each other. <clears throat> so next, let's see what are all these functions uh, that a system an identity management system have, had to make, and why I was introducing uh, centralization on the delegation of feature. Uh, so, of course, a, an identity management system need to be able to identify users, and in the computer world, that means authenticating users, and also services. It has to manage password, uh, and other options you might want to consider when you think about it, is whether you should do single sign-on, whether you should want to use uh, two-factor authentication. Uh, these uh, properties can change quite dramatically the way you can deploy services sometimes, uh, the way you can use authentication, uh, authentication applications. So you have to know in advance whether you want to use these, these uh, features or not. Uh, it also generally uh, manages certificates and keys. By certificates, I mean X500 certificates. Uh, most of the security on the HTTP protocol, which is quite popular these, these days, is based on, on SSL and specifically on the certificates, x 5 certificates that uh, the SSL infrastructure is made on, based on. Uh, keys uh, in many big networks uh, for management, you can use Kerberos or SSH here in being ambivalent. Uh, in both cases, you have keys that you deploy on machines and use 
to gain access to them? I, I'll try. Okay. Okay. And <clears throat> and you want to manage this. Uh, in 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 many Linux developments, see, uh, you may have a centralized server that does password authentication. Uh, classic services are NIS and LDAP, but then SSH keys or Kerberos key dApps are kind of managed manually. Uh, difficult to keep track, uh, especially for host keys. It becomes quite easily a mess. Uh, very quickly. Um, another thing, an, an IDM server might be the need to manage the authorization rules, uh, access rules per host, and user roles and administration delegation. Uh, in, in Linux, that means sudo, mostly. Uh, but it also means SC Linux in some cases. And other things that are normally not really associated with identity management, but I think uh, deserve a, a place in there are the necro level, DNS, DHCP, uh, and other things like maybe radius, things like that. Uh, finally, <coughs> auditing and reporting. I will not talk too much about those. Auditing and reporting are whole arguments on their own, but they are fundamental because <clears throat> if you have a large network, you need to know what is going on in the network, and you cannot base your understanding of what is going on if you don't have tools that allow you to gather logs and you know audit reports from many many machines and somehow distill and filter out what is interesting about them and what is not because in very large networks you have uh, much much more information coming in that you can possibly process by hand and so you really need to be able to deal with this with auditing and reporting in a, in, in a centralized way so that you can understand what's going on. And what are the responsibilities of the clients instead? And by clients, I mean any, any machine that is not actively providing an identity uh, management service like authentication, authorization uh, on a central service. Um, so clients, especially Linux clients, need to retrieve information about users, groups, uh, sometimes net groups. Um, roles. Um, uh, it needs to retrieve things like certificates and key tabs when it is instantiated. Uh, and there are other configurations like auto mount maps that are common in, in Unix based networks. Uh, clients need to perform authentication even though uh, passwords and keys may be held in a central server when you authenticate to a client uh, you actually perform the authentication partly of the client as well because the client is involved in the whole process of authenticating the user. Um, authorization is totally done on the client generally. Um, Hot based access control is done on the client. Pseudo rules are applied on the client even though you might keep this information centrally, it is the responsibility of the client to apply these rules. Uh, SSH keys are generally held on the client and SC Linux user make sense only on the specific client so far. Uh, other miscellaneous uh, clients might do is something like DNS discovery, DNS updates. Um, if you have used things like Windows and Active Directory, you would know that these clients tend to do a lot of DNS updates. And another thing that is very important but often neglected is time synchronization. We'll see later why. So in nutshell, there is a very, there's a lot of stuff to manage on a network that I put under the umbrella of identity management. And management tools are extremely important, uh, as important as the technology used under, underneath. Um, if a system cannot be managed, it can't simply be used. Um, I've I've done implementation of identity management system in the past that were just simply too complicated for people to use. Uh, to the point that when I was not around, they were useless. And the system is completely useless if the administrators cannot use it, cannot understand it. And one of the problems is that um, in free software, and I've been developing free software for quite a while, management is completely neglected. Uh, uh, 
free software developers are developers first, and they tend to think that everything is easy. And because you know we do understand the common line and we are very comfortable with it, uh, and we know generally the system very well, we tend to completely overlook the importance of providing management tools for users that are not as proficient, that are not developers. And so we might end up building systems that are not really usable, in my opinion. Um, co security and complexity are intertwined. Uh, if the system is complex and difficult to use for the administrator, it, it also means that uh, it might very easily get insecure. Uh, in, in many systems, you will see people take shortcuts like using uh, self-signed certificates or very simple passwords, sharing key tabs without, you know, over email. And these are all problems mostly due to the lack of management tools for this uh, security, uh, uh, for this important security uh, properties of a system like uh, using a self-signed certificate. It's not bad just because it's it shows you a bad page on Firefox when the user get there. The problem is that by using some science certificates, you train the user and even the admins to just skip the security warning of Firefox. You basically become completely insensitive to that security information. And it's very easy for an attacker then, uh, if you train your user to completely ignore that warning, to uh, create many, many middle attacks. Uh, an attacker will not have to care that much that it doesn't have access to your certificates. It will just put a self-signed one and count on the fact that the vast majority of users, when they see the warning page, will say, okay, you know, th this is the user self-certificate used by my admin. I will just say okay to Firefox and go on and, and put my password in. And you're just giving up your password to someone. Uh, but the problem with using self sign certificates is not much that admins are lazy. They are also lazy. But the problem is that there are not very useful tools or easy tools to manage certificates in a meaningful, meaningful way. And that's why admins tend to, or even developers tend to use self sign certificates, for example. Um, same goes for using, for example, uh, sending key tabs in an insecure way. Uh, it's not because people don't want to be secure. It's because they, are, they don't have tools to sanely manage this stuff. Uh, and they try to use the simplest way they can. Um, other things that are really important are diagnostic tools. Um, because complex systems never work 100% of the time. There's always something that breaks in a very complex system, and you need to know what breaks in order to, in order to go fix it. Because otherwise, uh, breakage break will compound until something will collapse. Um, and a word of advice, uh, whatever you think of when building these systems, try to keep it simple. Sometimes it's really not possible, and when it's not possible, you have to be, make it manageable. So let's try to get a bit on more on something more concrete. How hard can it be to actually build a management system? Uh, you know, as most admin would tell you, yeah, I just installed an LDAP server and I just installed a Kerberos server, right? How hard can it be? It's just you know, two packages. How many of you have actually uh, installed Kerberos, a KDC? Quite a few. How many of those will do it again? Mm, not many. You didn't like it. Some numbers. Uh, in six years, um, part of the Free APA project, the most important part for me, was to build something that was easy to manage and easy to install. Something that would take out the pain of installing LDAP in Kerberos, which you can see it's not just 
held up in Kerberos in the end once you start building stuff. Um, our installer, for example, makes 96 unique steps to build one IPA server. Oh. Might not seem a lot, but if you think that every time you have to install a new server, you have to do 96 steps, and that's not just 96 commands. Uh, by step, they are logical units, so it could be multiple commands, like uh, putting up an LD file, a schema in the server, then deploying the information in the DELDAP directory, then uh, running a bunch of commands to build the certificates and stuff, uh, and stuff like that. All this could be a single step. And, uh, and they are a lot. Making mistakes when you have to do almost 100 different steps to build a system is very easy. And in, in many cases, not only you will waste a lot of time, you may not notice that you forgot something that is critical. So for example, the free IP project, all these 96 steps take five minutes. And that's also very important because admins don't have time to babysit stuff for too long. They have a job to do. They have to actually manage those users, you have to manage those groups. They cannot waste days, weeks to build the systems. Because just building the system is kind of a waste of time because it's not productive. The system is doing nothing. You have machines and resources there that are not actually serving the user. And on the complexity, this stuff is 150K lines of code, mostly Python, that sit on top of all the components used. These 150k lines are not NTP, they are not directory server, they are not a PKI, they are not a KDC, they are just the bits that you need to manage and configure these systems. So it's a lot of code, because when, if you think about it. It's, it's not comprising any of the actual components. And part of the project, we also built a client, and that's another 150k lines. So it, it is hard. It is hard, but it is doable. It is doable, and the extent you want to do it depends on what you want to achieve, of course. So, uh, this is a, a picture of uh, what we decided to do when we built free IPA. This is just one possibility uh, for an entity managed system. You don't have to do it that way, uh, but we did it this way, and these are the components, and then I can just show a few of them, why they are there. So LDAP is the central directory where all the information is kept. Uh, there is a KDC, maybe it's K admin companion daemon, uh, that we use for mostly for authentication. Um, there is a CA component, that's a PKI, that we use uh, to manage certificates. And then there is a, a lot of code for the management interface that is built on Apache. So just simple web UI. Uh, finally, uh, we integrate the NTP and DNS uh, to provide services to the network. <coughs> As part of the project, we also built a client um, called SSSD, and so that's the final component that completes the actual picture. Um, we try to use as much as possible existing components to reduce the number of things we had to do. Uh, we try to use standards as much as possible. So why LDAP and Kerberos? Uh, some people come and ask this question, and it's, it's a quite legitimate question. Why are you using those components? Uh, some people prefer to use databases to keep users. Uh, a lot of web applications do that. Uh, they just build their own database that they use for other data, and they also put the users in there. That's actually managing users, so it's an identity management system. Uh, we choose LDAP uh, for a number of reasons, um, uh, mostly due to legacy and standard adoption. Uh, there are a lot of systems that already know how to talk to LDAP, especially when it comes to uh, distributing users on Unix machines. Uh, we had a server that was uh, well done and worked very well for multi-master replication and also support read-only uh, read replication, which we don't use in the free IPA product. But multi-master for us was one of the deal breaker because uh, 
we wanted to make it possible to distribute information. Because the problem is that we wanted to build a system that was not only, only easy to use, but it would scale uh, on, on a lot of machines. Because uh, we have customers in Red that have, that have a quite a bit of machines in the thousands or in the tens of thousands sometimes. So we wanted to build a system that could be used by these people as well. And you cannot build that with one server. You have to distribute uh, <coughs> information in multiple machines and sometimes in multiple geographical locations. So you need to have something you can put all the data around. Uh, LDAP also have, in all the implementations I know, has fine-grained access control in the form of ACIs that you can apply on single objects in LDAP, which is something that you cannot find using in, in SQL. In SQL, you must have access, for example, as a user, and then you have to build in the application the logic to uh, control the access, uh, while in LDAP it's, it's built, it's there for you, you don't have to do anything. And finally, again, standards based. We didn't want to invent our own database, we want to use something that is standardized and out there. Um, and so, that's why we used uh, LDAP as a, as a database, uh, and some people come and ask why Kerberos? I mean, I use Open LDAP and I'm happy. Uh, why should I care about using something like Kerberos? Um, and that's because we wanted to make sure that uh, the level of security could be higher if you want to. The one point uh, that we made in Free IPA one was that uh, you can use LDAP if you want. You can ignore completely the Kerberos path. Uh, the, uh, the LDAP server has the password of the users. You could use authentication. But using passwords has a big problem. And the big problem is that when you use a password, you're basically giving up your identity to whatever service you send your password to. So if you have a web application somewhere that asks for your password to authenticate to the central system, now not only you and the central system has a, have a password, that web application has a password as well. And if that web application is compromised, then the attacker has your password that can access other systems that may have a much higher security profile. Uh, so using bare passwords uh, basically weakens the whole security architecture because you are as secure as your worst application. And in most corporate networks, uh, the security of some application is bad. Really, really, really bad. Um, if you use Kerberos instead, what you give to application is not a password is a token, and that token has meaning only for that specific service, for that specific application. So if the application is compromised, uh, it cannot do anything. The only thing the application knows is your identity, so it can authorize you to do whatever you have to do, but it cannot take that, ident that identification information and try to use it against other services. So that's why Kerberos is important, even though it's difficult to use sometimes. <clears throat> Certificates can also be used for this purpose. However, the problem with using certificates is that they are much, much harder to manage. Uh, they are not, uh, they require you, the user to store information in the form of certificate and carry it around multiple machines, and that's cumbersome. Uh, we offer certificates as part of free API, although not for users, uh, but we didn't choose it as the authentication mechanism uh, because of that, because of the difficulty in actually using uh, these credentials. Um, one other reason we use Kerberos is for scalability. One of the very good points of Kerberos is that because you're using tickets, when you have to authenticate multiple times against an application, you don't have to hit the central server to check the password. Because once you get a ticket, that ticket is valid for an amount of time, usually between a few hours, sometimes a few days. And once you have it, you can just go and talk to the application without having to talk to any central server. So basically, you reduce the load against central servers while distributing it to all the applications. And again, security and standard. We didn't want to invent anything new, especially when it has to do with crypto. OK, in the, in the, in the image, image here, I also showed you a, a CA. Uh, that uh, the certificate authority using a, uh, a public key infrastructure, but why using a public key infrastructure? Well, the reason is 
uh, that a lot, a lot of protocols use SSL certificates instead of uh, key tabs to cycle the connection between the user and the service. Uh, you know, a web server uses HTTPS normally, uh, but even IMAP, SMTP, they're much easier to uh, integrate uh, when using SSL because applications at most know how to do SSL in many cases. Um, however, the big problem of using SSL in, a, in, a, in an organization or a network is that uh, <coughs> you have to manage certificates. You have to distribute certificates, you have to sign certificates, and that's a, a very difficult task to do unless you have a component that can do it for you. So we integrated uh, a PKA system in there as well so that all the certificates for all the machines can be easily managed. It's, it's part of the IDM system in, in, in our idea. And it makes one thing uh, very simple. Uh, if you put the certificate authority certificates in the, in the browser of your machines, then the user doesn't have the warning that a soft site certificate has been used. Uh, you can just access the website just like you know you do for a bank or for you know whatever Google or anything. They have a certificate signed by uh, certificate authorities that are recognized by your browser. By inserting your own CA in the browser, you do the same for all the machines in your own network. And you don't have to go and train user to ignore security warnings. <coughs> And DNS, why DNS is crucial and why it is important to integrate it. <clears throat> so all the services you have in a network basically use a name to be recognized. When a user wants to access a server, doesn't know anything about the IP addresses. Uh, it knows at most a name when it knows it. Um, X509 certificates, they works only with names. You have to put a name in the certificate and the machine has to keep that name. SSH keys, if you look at when you do an SSH to another host, it will identify the key and, as and associate it with a name. Uh, SSH also associated with an IP address, but IP addresses are basically obscure. And also because IPv6 is coming, at some point it will come, and it's really impossible to remember an IPv6 address. Uh, they're just too long. And although DNS at the moment is insecure, uh, even though it's useful for all these things that are involved in security, like SSH and 509, uh, there are mitigation coming. DNSSEC uh, is having a decent adoption, uh, slow but decent. And there are ways also to handle DNS updates from machines in a secure way using TSIG or GSS T6, which is what we use in free API. Um, so even though DNS is insecure in the normal case, it can be made secure. And that's one thing that we don't have, we haven't done completely yet, for example, in free API. The DNSSEC part is very complex, but we're planning to do and something that everybody that is deploying DNS this day should really think about doing. Another component that is pretty neglected, and that's why I want to point it out, is, is NTP. Um, NTP is the network time protocol, and it is critical for a lot of things. Uh, in our case, it's critical especially for Kerberos, where there is this famous Kerber 5 clock skew. Uh, because it, we don't want to have tickets for years forever, one of the things that are done when you're checking a Kerberos ticket in an application uh, that's done by the libraries and then it is that the ticket is checked for time. If, if you're trying to get a ticket and the request you're sending is not within five minutes uh, between the client and the server, the request simply dropped. You're not allowed to do that. And that's used to avoid reply attacks and things like that. Um, but it's also important for many other processes, for example, uh, log correlation. As I said before, one important thing is when you have many, many machines, you really need to be able to gather all the logs. But gathering logs is important also for log correlation. You want to understand what is going on. Uh, you want to be able to correlate that client one is failing when server two is also failing. And if, if time is not kept in sync on all machines, 
that's not easy to do. You will have one machine that thinks it's one hour, and the other machine thinks it's, you know, one machine thinks it's 1 p.m., the other machine thinks it's 3 p.m. When you try to correlate logs, you will not see that they are actually having a misbehave at the same time. And that is particularly important in security uh, when analyzing uh, access partners, stuff like that. And there are a bunch of other services that we haven't uh, integrated in, in free IPA, but uh, might make sense to in some cases, uh, like DHCP, Radius, Radius is an authentication server, maybe even telephony, why not? Uh, a lot of people are implementing SIP in their companies, and the phone is as much as identification as anything else. When you want to call a person, you use a phone. And there is a lot of, a, there, are, there are a lot of attacks going on in the wild against SIP phones. Uh, because SIP phones are fully managed systems, they are actual computers. Uh, they just run a very specialized application and you can attack a SIP phone and then use it to gain access to the network. And that is being done. So it can be seen as something to manage as well. Uh, I'm sorry if this is not of your liking, but I want to stress that a management interface is fundamental and is one of the primary uh, things we've been developing in FreeAPA. It's really a fundamental uh, component. You could have technologically the best thing on earth. Uh, you know, all the components might work perfectly, but if you don't have a way to manage uh, this system, uh, cohesively, uh, it's, it's useless. I can have hundreds of LDAP servers, but if I'm the only one that knows the LDAP command line and the other in the company can, you know, it's, you're making a single point of failure of the people that designed the system and built it because nobody else can use it. Uh, so if you, if you think about building a management system, I recommend thinking about things like network APIs. Uh, you want to make life easier for admins to actually be able to use the system. And for them, use the system means also being able to pilot the system from their own, uh, for their own reasons. Uh, uh, we have had a lot of people come to us and ask, how can I create users from this other machine foo that we, you know, HR uses and contain all the users in, that HR know about? We want to bring all these users on the Unix machines, but we need a way to connect these two systems. And an API is fundamental to that. Uh, sometimes you can, you know, get away with common line tools for that. Uh, you know, the administrator can cobble up an SSH, you know, onto the machine that calls a bunch of scripts, but if you have an actual API, it makes it much easier to integrate. Uh, and although it's completely not mandatory, uh, a graphical interface really helps, especially uh, when you have to deal with uh, people that work in things like help desk or managers. Um, it makes the system usable by a lot, by a much larger number of people, empowers them to do operations without having to contact uh, more knowledgeable people, and you free more knowledgeable people to work on what matters, uh, you know, building more systems, uh, you know, low level uh, management, you don't have to do things like resetting passwords for users. You don't want to use an admin that is very skilled to reset a password for a user. You want to have someone else, like the user's manager or a helpless person to do that. And you have to give them tools, because otherwise they cannot do that, because they cannot really understand very easily how to use a common line interface in most cases. And so this is just an example of what we built. It doesn't have to be really fancy. Uh, in our case, is just a number of menus that you go through, uh, but it has to be really effective. You just have to show and allow you to do what you need to do. It is usually just creating some sort of grouping. Uh, could be user groups, could be roles, it could be groups of other rules, and, and then have a way to associate users and machines to these groups. That's all it is really in the end. Uh, DNS is slightly different, but it's not really difficult. Uh, uh, from my point of view, kind of boring. I didn't do it, so. but 
but uh, it's really important for the actual users of the system. When we <coughs> show this interface the admin to, to our customers even, uh, they are really happy because they can do what I just said before, give access to less knowledgeable user to do operations without uh, tying up resources of very knowledgeable ones. <coughs> so this is uh, for the server, uh, all the components. On the client, servers are important, but if the client can do something, there isn't much use in putting up a, a, a server infrastructure. Uh, so what could, what can the classic Linux client do uh, that we used as a base to start with free IPA uh, uh, six years ago? Uh, six years ago, the situation was that a Linux client can use an SSL DAP or other things like an SSL V or a uh, number of an SSL DAP D, which is descendant of an SSL DAP. Um, although generally, these tools, at least NSSL that was, was built to retrieve the information without authentication from LDAP. So just, you know, I connect an LDAP server without encrypt or encryption or anything, and I pull information. Uh, K management uh, on Linux client manual. There are no native tools to do any kind of key management. If you generate SSH keys, you have to build your own scripts to, to distribute them. Uh, key tabs the same, use key admin at most. Um, laptops uh, have been traditionally very hard to integrate uh, when using things like NIST and LDAP, mostly because there was no real decent offline support. So if you have a laptop, most of the time you have a laptop because you travel, you move, you don't, you don't want to have to be tied to the network, but with a classic Linux client, if you detach the laptop from the network, you would not, you would not be able to, to authenticate anymore when using LDAP because the LDAP server is not available. And so solutions were things like, okay, we create a local account on the laptop as well, so when you're not on the network, you can use that local account, but you're bringing back all the management issue by doing that because now you still have to have all the scripts that pull the information from some system and create this local user. <coughs> Um, access control also very difficult to manage. Uh, there are no good tools. There are something things like AM access maybe for those that know is it, but still requires uh, additional management infrastructure to distribute configuration files and same for sudo. <coughs> so one of the things we had to do uh, in Free API, and this is the only uh, development we did for one of the components was create SSSD. Um, it's, I think, four years old now. Um, about 150K lines of code. Um, what does it do is that it solves a number of issues that were not solvable a few years ago. Uh, one of them is uh, to use a single authenticated connection to a server. Uh, with NSS LDAP, unless you use NSCD, you have a bunch of processes that need to get data from LDAP, every single one of them will open a connection to the server. So if you have 100 processes on the system, you could conceivably have 100 connections to LDAP for a single system. And if you have 2,000 systems doing that, that means 100,000 connections to a server, you're going to kill that server. So we wanted a daemon, not a simple, a simple library that is embedded in every process of the system, that could handle that. Another very important uh, part was caching of information and identity. Uh, that resolves very well the, LDAP, uh, the laptop case, but it's not the only reason we did that. We did it mostly to also avoid load on the servers. If you can cache information locally on the machine, you don't have to query the central server so much. And if you have to reboot the central server because you're doing maintenance, you're not going to disrupt servers that might be very critical. Uh, they have the information cache locally. Uh, they can survive uh, for a few minutes or hours even if the central server is down, if they can cache the information. If they can now cache information, as soon as the central server goes down, you might start seeing outages in the services you're providing, and that's really bad. 
Uh, then we started adding something like our cloud authentication. Again, this is useful for laptops, but services uh, all the like. And other things like host-based access control, pseudo rules. Uh, what we do is that we can pull this information from the LDAP server and make it available to the client without having to create your own scripts. So you, know, you just configure SSD once and it, and it keeps working like that. Um, server affinity and DNS updates are other very important things. When you join a machine to a free APA server, uh, these machines can automatically update the DNS uh, so that uh, the name you gave it is automatically made uh, available to everybody. Um, okay. Last slide because time is up. Uh, building an IDM, an IDM system is very hard. And it's more of a process in the end than a product. My side is to build a product, but it's not, it doesn't end there. Uh, you have to implement it. So there is a whole process going through defining what are the needs of the, of the organization, what uh, you can do to, to, what you want to implement, what you want to use, how you want to use it. Uh, installing the bits is just the first step. Um, and the other very important thing is that the IDM system must make things easy to manage. Otherwise, really is useless. And again, I, I insist, management is the fundamental part. Um, homegrown systems have been used so far. Uh, I personally think that is a bit of a waste of time to build a homegrown system these, these days. Um, but if you think that your situation requires something that you have to build on your own because none of the available system gives you enough. Uh, try to follow a couple of very simple rules. Use as many components as possible. The more you have to develop yourself, the more you have to uh, maintain yourself and maintenance is very expensive. Uh, choose wisely. Uh, if you choose the wrong component, changing later can be very difficult due to network effects. Uh, all these systems are exposed to clients, and if you have to change them, you may have to change also the clients that could prevent you to do that. Uh, and look around you. A lot of people have solved problems. Uh, some of them have built solutions like us. Others have simply solved the problem but put information out there. So look around. Okay. Uh, that's it. Yeah, I guess, I don't know if there's time for questions. There's nobody else after this talk, right? There's nobody else after this talk. There's another talk after this one. Is there? I don't think so, right? No. Okay. okay. Um, this one should be Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, identity management is clearly one of the, the areas where Microsoft is doing a lot better. Uh, since they understood very early some of the things you explained, like uh, good management interface and uh, tightly integrated components. And there are still some uh, very uh, critical pieces missing in the, missing in the, the open source stack, like uh, the, the example I have in mind is that uh, open LDAP objects uh, cannot expire, which is uh, crucial when, you do, when they contain uh, authorizations. Authorizations should always expire. It is a security uh, basic concept. And you cannot make them expire, so you have to use a configuration uh, system, uh, an external configuration system, so you delegate this checking to the client. Uh, and anyway, this is just an example, but uh, do you know if there, are, if there is some effort to implement the, the missing parts uh, of um, identity management for Linux? Yeah, if I understand what, correctly, what you're asking, what you're saying is that there are a number of things that expire, like certificates. Are we going to build something that manages that? Is that a question? I, I, yeah. Can you, can you talk louder, please? I if, didn't understand. If I understood correctly, what you're saying is that there are a number of things like certificates that expires, and that affect the way uh, infrastructure are managed, whether we do something for that in free IPA. 
Is that the question, or what I have? do I have advice for no, that? There are, there, there are objects that should expire, like sudo rules, uh, mm -hmm. and you cannot make them expire directly in, in the directory. Um, well, sure, you can make everything expire. Um, the way uh, we've done that with our free API, uh, we have rules that you, where you can put uh, an expiration time on. Uh, the point is whether the clients respect that rules. Uh, in Linux, with the sudo adapt, there is a sudo not before, not after uh, rule, and it is respected. But it depends on the client whether it respects that or not. For certificates, for example, in Free API, we have a service that can renew certificates because certificates do expire. So we have built knowledge in our system about these problems. Uh, same for with, with uh, Kerberos tickets. They do expire eventually. So we have built uh, some tools in the client to allow you to handle that problem or that annoyance correctly. So you add that functionality outside of uh, LDAP itself? Well, the information may be in LDAP. But the problem is that the enforcement of the information necessarily depends on the users of that information. The LDAP server itself cannot really do anything to the pseudo binary. The pseudo binary need to respect the information and other tools as well. Hello. Uh, I actually have a couple of questions, but maybe I'll start and you can interrupt me when it's too much. Okay. So for start, uh, is it possible to integrate the free IPA uh, certification authority to use the HSM? HSM? Yes. You mean for the PKI? Yes. So the PKI we use is DogTag, which uh, is the open source upstream project for Red Hat certificate server. Uh, Dogta does have HSM capabilities, but we haven't integrated them in the free IPA product. Um, in order to make it possible to easily install free IPA, we had to simplify some things. So not all the features of the underlying products are always available now. They might be in the future. Uh, the way we handle people that have needs like HSM is that we, we advise them to install their own PKI, for example, for user certificates that we don't provide through a free API, and then make free API subordinate CA and use it only for uh, the certificates that are distributed on machines, like web servers, or for use for IMAP or VPN, stuff like that, only for device certificates. Okay, the second one. Uh, you mentioned auditing. So how is auditing currently implemented in free IPA? And do you support some kind of integrity checks and uh... So the auditing for part is not uh, really well developed yet. Um, uh, we started the project within the free IPA project itself to do auditing better. However, uh, there are so many moving parts at the moment in the Linux landscape when it comes to auditing. Uh, a lot of concurrent projects were started both within Red Hat and with, outside of Red Hat in the community uh, that made it really difficult to choose a good component. And so we decided to actually postpone an integrated auditing system. Uh, we still have that on the radar, but we are a bit on the low cut. At the moment, every single component does its own logging auditing, but we, 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 we don't have an aggregator, which is really important indeed. Uh, but we don't have that yet in Free IPA. So you mentioned that uh, you recommend your customers to use a dedicated CA if they want to use the HSM. So uh, can you tell me, is it easy to replace uh, the CA component in Free IPA? For example, if I want to use uh, EGBCA as a CA provider. Uh, once installed, it's not easy to replace it. Uh, so if you're going to try free APA and your, and your plan is to use it as a board in the CA, you should do that you know, when you install it. When you install it, you should make it as a board in the CA at that point. Uh, however, there is, uh, we, we can actually renew certificates in there 
even for the CA. So it's not impossible, it's just not easy. But the, the problem is that <clears throat> once you have a whole lot of certificates out there, and if you're going to change the CA, you know, it's not an easy problem to solve. The way we, we, we are going to solve it, it's not fully solved yet, is by making it possible to rotate the CA and have the client tools pull the new CA in a way that you can keep two CAs going uh, side by side until you recycle all the other certificates and then you finally remove the old CA certificate from the client and just use the new one. But it is a process that requires time because you have basically to, you have to renew all the certificates on all the machines. At least if you want to remove the old certificate, you, you may just leave the old certificate um, and start using the new, but the problem is that with SSL, you need to have revocation. And so you cannot really just abandon the previous one. It's, it's a hard problem. Hi. Uh, yep. um, I understand that this, uh, this particular project is, uh, uh, let's say, dedicated uh, around identity management on uh, provisioning accounts and authorization on Unix systems, mainly, you know. Uh, on the other side, uh, my question is, uh, uh, do you think there is, uh, or well, or maybe it's already in progress, uh, uh, would, uh, the idea of extending this, uh, the framework, the, the, the work project to uh, what, what is, uh, for example, to, to let it more uh, near to other identity management solution, even if not open source like, uh, that could implement business process or uh, provisioning accounts also to other systems that are not strictly Unix related like uh, 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 databases or uh, subsystems or other stuff like that. Just um, for example, uh, IBM uh, uh, solutions or Novell solutions, uh, Open IBM or Oracle Identity Manager, those kind of functionalities. Sorry, I didn't get the question yet. The, the audio here is a bit bad when public make questions. So can you try to make a very short question and speak loudly as well? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, my question is, uh, do you think uh, uh, if this project is uh, only uh, related to uh, identity management of Unix account, or there is also the intention to extend it to other systems in the future and to implement other functionalities for okay. business related. Now the question is clear. Yeah, so our focus is primarily Linux machines, very focused on that. Uh, because of the way we use standards, uh, other Unix machines can very easily be integrated in. Uh, we've done Solaris and even AAX back in the time. Mac OS, there have been some users that contribute the uh, documentation. If you're thinking Windows, the answer is um, sort of. Uh, the problem uh, is very, it's, it's too long to explain in, a, in, a, in an answer, in a Q&A, uh, so maybe you can come later and I can explain to you. We have a way to deal with Windows side, but we decided very explicitly not to try to manage Windows machines directly. Okay, thanks. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately we don't have time for other questions. Uh, this was the latest, last talk in the Jensen room. I'd like to thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Um, before everyone goes, <coughs> Just point out that tomorrow